Aloha. It's March the 16th, 2022. It's Wednesday o'clock. That can mean only one thing. Time for What Now America. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's title is USA and the World Could Do Much More for Ukraine. Uh, with me, my guests today are Jay Fidel, Karen Buzzard, and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we got a whole full agenda, so let's get to it. Jay, uh, we just heard uh, President Zelensky uh, get before Congress and ask again and again for, for things that we're not giving him. Uh, one, he's asking for uh, enforcement of a no-fly zone, and he's asking for fighter jets. Uh, first question is, uh, is he hitting all the right notes in his ability to request Congress for something that President Biden and mo many people in Congress don't want to comply with? Yes. <clears throat> yes, he is. Um, I think you know, what's, what's really interesting, and it's a nuanced point, is if he asks for something that they're not inclined to give, what he's doing is setting the stage to have them give it uh, once Putin goes further. For example, if, he, if Putin uses uh, chemical weapons, uh, bio, bio weapons, um, then, then Putin's going further. And he is pushing um, Biden off that cliff. If, if Putin goes one step further, it offers Biden the opportunity of meeting Zelensky's request. So what he's doing is setting up a scenario that will, A, limit Putin from doing anything more horrendous, if that's possible. Uh, and B, if he does something more horrendous, uh, then it gives, it gives Biden cover uh, for meeting Zelensky's demands. So I think it's really a smart move. Let me ask you this. I thought this was a smart move, and he's done it before, but he, he really hits the note, in my opinion, right on the, very well by saying, hey, this is a matter of world democracy and the avoidance of autocracy, which has plagued Europe, obviously, for, for hundreds of years. And um, he seems to be making some great inroads into that. Is it is a striking a chord or a note within the American population audience? Well, it's certainly striking a note within the foreign affairs um, you know, uh, audience, because uh, there was an article about this very thing called uh, Pax Americana, um, just a few days ago, and they talked about, uh, you know, the battle of the great powers and uh, Russia wants to be a great power and America is a great power and China is a great power. Arguably, um, after being consolidated in this affair, uh, Europe uh, could be and or is or will be uh, a great power. But Putin wants to be a great power. And that's the bottom line. Uh, yeah, sure. He wants the border, you know, to go further west. Yeah, sure. He wants the glory of, um, you know, of the USSR. But more than that, he's participating in what, you know, is described in this article a few days ago in Foreign Affairs. Um, and it's very instructive to think of it that way. It's, it's a clash of great powers. And he wants to be there on the stage. What haven't we done for, for Ukraine as, as a nation? Now, uh, President Biden just announced an additional $800 million strictly for um, military, being an uh, anti-arms um, anti, uh, uh, armor situations, or I think that would be uh, the javelin um, weapons, and certainly about 7,000 for small arms and about 800 for anti-aircraft, which would mean stinger missiles. Uh, what have we done and what aren't we doing enough of? Oh, there's another kind of anti-aircraft anti missile. I uh, forget the name right now, but um, it's more powerful than um, the, uh, uh, the javelin or the stinger. Um, and it's, uh, it's a battery of weapons and that you can deploy. I'm not sure it's all that mobile, um, but it will bring these MiGs right out of the sky. And uh, we have not provided that yet, although we've talked about providing it. So if you ask me what else they can do short of, you know, delivering fighter planes into the skies, um, you know, for, uh, you know, a, um, what do you call it? Um, no fly. Uh, no fly zone. Um, that's what the U.S. could do. These, these batteries of anti-aircraft um, Do you agree with President Biden that there should not be a no fly zone? 
I'll tell you the truth. I go back and forth. It depends on what I'm reading today, what you're sending me, all these people sending me. <laughs> and for every article that says yes, there's an article that says no. And I, and I keep listening to Karen and she tells me no. Uh, <laughs> I would agree with Karen. I didn't know I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I think we're going to get there, Tim. Uh, there's a very interesting frontline movie. I should have sent all you guys a link that just appeared on PBS last night. It's, it's the history of, um, of Putin. It's how he got here, the road to war, I think. Because it is most interesting. And it talks about him and, and his war mm, strategies and tactics over the years. Uh, he's been in power 22 years now. And he's done this sort of thing a lot. He's killed a lot of people. He's a monster. And his M.O. is all the same. I mean, for example, uh, when he was first taking power, um, he set up a, a, a fake attack on a school uh, in, in Russia. I mean, it was a real attack. Um, and he blamed the Chechnyans for it. And then he went and he blasted the Chechnyans. So, uh, you know, a lot of school kids, young school kids died. It was really awful, horrible war crime. And it was him. Uh, and, and then using that as a, a starter, um, he, he killed a lot of Chechnyans. He bombed, he bombed them the way he's bombing. Well, he also went into that theater and just slaughtered everybody. Yeah, so that's what he does. That's his Remember the MO. theater um, yeah. and how he approached that. Yeah. yeah, that's what he does. He's done it over and over again. And I don't know if the Russian people understand what a monster he is, um, but his MO is always the same. And so his MO now is going to be um, to slaughter people. He's, he's a slaughterer. Um, and I, when the when word, get, word gets out on the streets of Moscow, I mean, people really figure it out. Uh, they're not going to they're not going to want him in office. I'm not sure how much power they have because he's he's really finessed the ability to stay in power. He's, he's good at that. So um, I guess to, to answer your question, I, I, I think um, we know him well enough to know that he is going to continue to do this. And if he continues to do this. Um, he's going to step it up. That's what he always does. In each one of those examples, those instances over the past 22 years, he's stepped it up. He's a monster. And if he does that, as I said at the very beginning of the show, um, it's, going to, it's going to cross the red line um, for NATO, for the EU, for the, for the US, for Congress, for Biden. And I, I think all of a sudden, um, Karen and I will agree. Karen, you're listening. Karen and I will agree that what we need to do is put a lot of weapons in there, including jets and fighter planes. planes. Okay. Well, for now, um, Karen, to you, uh, you know, President Zelensky saying, hey, I need fighter jets. And the United States has uh, nixed the deal that uh, there would be 20, I think it was 20 MiG jets to be delivered to Ukraine. And, and uh, the United States kind of uh, doesn't want that. They, uh, President Biden said that's direct involvement. Aren't there some innovative ways, Ukraine, some MiG jet? Uh, let me just throw this out for you and just let me have you react to it. What's to prevent a neutral country that has an Air Force that has MiG jets? And this country happens not to be a NATO country, but a, an independent country with an independent sovereign right to give arms to another country or sell arms to another country. What's to prevent a hypothetically in Argentina to say, hey, we got 28 MiG jets and we'll prevent uh, the pilots from Ukraine from flying over there, getting in those MiG jets and flying them to Ukraine. Uh, well, I guess it would could if it would you mean to fly from Venezuela with jets to over there? Sure, or or vice versa. Just well, I guess how the pilots to to fly into the country, like country, a non a non NATO country, non NATO, and fly over and pick up the jets and fly them back. And that way, NATO's not involved. Well, it would still be an attack from one country on another country. If you know, even if it was flown by a different country, uh, they would be no, not flown by a different country, flown by Ukrainian pilots. Oh, well, these so are they, MiG, oh, these are MiG jets. That's, that's what they want to fly is MiG jets. And there's plenty of countries out there that are non-NATO countries that have plenty of MiG jets. Why, 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 why are we not thinking out of the box on this? Um, what, well, actually, what's what's timing the administration on this one? I'm going to make a counter argument. I think we're going in the wrong direction. I think we should de-escalate the military uh, involvement and not and try to work on the diplomatic side because I think just did, did, uh, Tim. Did I say that I was going to agree with Karen about anything? Like yeah, but you, you're going to have to hold out for remark. a minute before yeah, I. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do a follow-up question, Karen. <laughs> get ready. Yeah. Now I, you made a quite quite a bold statement there, and I I respect all claims. Um, 
Didn't we try that before Putin just said, I don't care, I'm going in? And, well, began, it, the, and began the atrocities? We and, tried it in 1938. Okay, Karen, you have the well, floor. Uh, if you look at the history of NATO, uh, I think that whole history has been erased by the media, including in that documentary, which I thought was very biased, Jay, uh, last night. They haven't looked at the history of NATO aggression in Eastern Europe and provoking Putin. So I think unless both sides can look at the truth of what's really happening, there can be no negotiation. Okay, so I'm going to interrupt the it. Side on Karen, the table, just Karen I, I respect you as a guest, but I, I'm going to interrupt you for a second because, okay, okay. Um, you know, when we make, we, we make statements, so we should expect follow-up questions. And one's going to be uh, all the things that Jay mentioned and that Putin has been guilty of, of how he's invaded Russia, uh, how he's invaded um, Crimea, sure. Um, doesn't that count for the counter argument that you're trying to present? Uh, well, I think there was a, uh, you know, it's not like Putin has no reason behind what he's doing. He's interested in his national security. Crimea, there was a Russian naval base there that he, you know, his theory was he was protecting the naval base from U.S. But uh, also, if you kind of research the history of it, the same situation arose during Obama's administration, but Obama refused to send military weapons. He sent, quote, support, but not military weapons, including these missiles that are being sent now. So there was no escalation, but I think that escalating, uh, you know, particularly now with the uh, what's become a kind of local conflict into a, not, a worldwide conflict could lead to a World War III, which is you know, nuclear, nuclear. No, I understood that, understood yes, that concern. Yes. I, I get that. Yes. And that's why maybe the, the no fly zone is off limits. And I, I agree with you on that point. But to de-escalate the military uh, approach here, when he's aggressively slaughtering well, innocents, I, um, I think not... I'm, I, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, well, I'm just saying that, you know, what's the next step? Okay, what, so here's the follow up question. What if uh, uh, Putin uses chemical or biological weapons. What's your response then? Well, as I say, I don't think we should, that's why I don't think we should escalate it because it's just gonna escalate into who can use the worst weapons, who can wipe out the most people, uh, who can destroy the most buildings. It sort of becomes a war of- uh, Do you, you know, think that negotiating with Putin, is, he's gonna capitulate and back off? Is that your belief? He would if you know the right things were on the table. Right now, the U.S. has refused to put the neutrality of Ukraine on the table. That was the key point of the negotiation that Anthony Blinken would not consider. And also, I wanted to point out, if you read a lot about the history of, um, of Ukraine, that actually some people consider that in 2014, there was a coup led by Victoria Nuland, who was now kind of head of um, what's going on now, and she was appointed by Obama to overthrow the legitimate election. And there's tapes of them you can find online taking the new administration that would be anti-Russian. That was their key goal. So they put in place. Uh, so it's not like we have been, it's just they've been, you know, set, we haven't been setting by neutral. We've been involved in Ukraine for a long time. And we've been- Well, uh, Ukraine's a breakaway <laughs> state from the Soviet Union. Union. Yes, I would expect they want a, a non-Russian partisan to be part of the government. I, that yeah, makes sense. We have been underhandedly. We haven't been honest about our involvement in Ukraine. It's not like we had no involvement. We had a major involvement in there. And actually, a lot of people feel, have you ever heard of the Wolfowitz policy? That, that's a neo -conservative. Paul Wolfowitz? Paul uh, Wolfowitz? Of, of, of Iraq fame? That, yes. Yeah, basically, that that some people feel that uh, Biden is following this now. Uh, and Victoria Newland was one of the neoconservatives who thought this up, was that the US should be the dominant superpower and they should uh, prevent any other power from gaining any kind of um, standing. So basically right now, the two powers they're most concerned about are Russia and China. So um, the expansion of NATO, I think into Eastern Europe, actually it was promised it would not expand and Bill Clinton was the first president to start expanding it, um, was a, a clear th threat to Russian from the beginning. And I think the continuation of that policy was provocative to Russia. 
and particularly bringing it up right to their back door stuff. Okay. Yeah. All right. I got to go to Cynthia, but I will say that provocative begets provocative and his aggressive right. moves in the world stage has been provocative. So it's right. not a surprise that uh, nations near Russia said, hey, NATO, bring me in, please. So um, again, provocative begets provocative. Cynthia, go yeah, before, you. before I forget, Tim, I'd like to say that I, I disagree with everything that Karen has said. One, I know, but you um, already agreed with her. So you get no, to do I, both. No, I, I, don't, I, I agree that we shouldn't put fighter planes there now. But that's the only thing. Um, okay, I just want to just want to punctuate that. Uh, well, let me clarify that fighter planes or, or the no fly zone. There's a difference. Same. You think the same? Okay, uh, Cynthia, going to you. I know we you have a list of things we've done thus far and things we're going to do. Why don't you hit that list? Hey, um, first I'd like to say that Biden today called Putin a war criminal. Uh, he did it. So it's been established that Putin is a bad guy, not just because we instigated it or he was threatened. Should he have said that? Um, <laughs> let me break into that. Should he have said that? Is that going to hamper future negotiations with Russia, be it uh, nuclear arms reductions or any other kind of negotiations? Was that a bridge too far or was it appropriate for him to say it? I think it was appropriate, but I but it was done in a really odd way. It was sort of an it was a, a question of a Fox News reporter, and he didn't he didn't hear it quite right. And he said no the first time, and then because she said, "Do you consider um, Vladimir Putin a, a war criminal?" And he said no, and then he stopped and turned around and said, "Wait a minute, what did you say? If he is a war criminal, because yes, I think he is a war criminal." He said those words, and All right, I, so he further clarified it and defined it. All right. I don't think it makes a difference in any kind of um, uh, negotiations with Russia. Anything that Russia does right now is a lie. We have to just look at everything he does as projection. He's either accusing someone else of doing it and is about to do it or has already done it, or he just is lying to try to keep his people in Russia under his thumb, like Jay said, right? When they really know the truth about what's happening, I can't imagine that they are not going to just ride. Well, maybe you answered my question and maybe I didn't hear it. Was it? appropriate for the president of the United States to call the leader of Russia a war criminal? And how will that, if, uh, if at all, uh, hamper future interaction with Russia? I don't think it will hamper it. And I think he was right to call him that. He's okay. not the first leader to do that. There's quite a few other leaders that have done the same thing. And so I think it's important that we label him that so that we can label what he's doing as criminal and not instigated, sorry, Karen, <laughs> but definitely. Uh, but I have to say, to go back, we're war criminals too. If you look at what we did to Afghanistan, Afghanistan and Ukraine, it's sort of like the pot calling the kettle black, you know? what if We killed over a million people uh, in those countries, but they don't seem to count somehow. I don't know, but Ukrainians uh, all of a sudden count. So I think yeah, we have- I like your, I like, like your, uh, I'd like to check your fact on that. Okay, I don't, I don't Okay, so I'm going to go back to what you asked me first, instead of going off on a tangent about him calling Putin a war criminal, and that is the exact things that are in this next tranche of things that are going over to um, to Ukraine. 800 Stinger anti-aircraft systems, 2,000 Javelins, 1,000 light anti-armor weapons, 6,000 A24 anti-armor systems, 100 tactical unmanned aerial systems. So he's sending drones. That's very new. That's a good thing. Um, that is new. OK, let me hit that point. That is new. How is that different than providing jets? It's not defense. I mean, it's defensive, not offensive. Providing the jets, I think, or putting the the jets up in the air for the anti I and mean, for the no fly zone. It that's all. No, I didn't say no fly zone. Oh, I just said giving them jets so they can meet R R um, Russia in the air over sovereign airspace. Well, I have been the same like you. Just you know, ship some of those pi that Ukrainian pilots to Germany. Have them pick up those MIGs that got sent there from Poland. Well, Germany is a NATO country. That doesn't look good. 
But this is the thing that's Poland didn't want it to be on them. They wanted it to be on the United States. So that's why they sent them to Germany. First. Well, I, I go to the point that Germany is a NATO country. Send them to a non-NATO country. Send them to Argentina. Send them I, to Venezuela. I agree with you, and I think that's a great idea. And I don't understand why they can't get creative, like you said, to get those planes to these guys. But I know that for what they're saying anyway, and what what's being put out there is that it these are defensive weapons, and those the no-fly zone or the jets would be a, a defense, I mean, an offensive. So they don't want to do anything that's offensive, just defensive, which I don't quite understand where the okay. difference You know, I mean, what I, what I hear, not, and I'm not picking on you, Cynthia, but it well, seems that the United States has allowed Putin to define the, the playing field, to define what is offensive, what is defensive, what's allowable, what's going to prompt him into a nuclear uh, warning and it's saber rattling. Um, if you're a jet and you're bombing over a sovereign country, um, civilian targets, um, putting a jet up in the air is not offensive. It's defensive. Right. Yeah, I it has offensive capability if it goes into Russian airspace and bomb Russian uh, civilian targets. But to, to, to take a jet out of the air with your own jet to stop them from indiscriminately killing, um, I'm not sure that's offensive. Well, you know, I agree with you, Tim, completely. And I think that those those MiGs should have already been there. That it's like ridiculous that Okay, that's what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to figure out who thinks that the MiGs is inappropriate, appropriate. I, who thinks the fly zone is appropriate or inappropriate? I got you on well, record. Unfortunately, we we don't get to tell them what to do or what to think, unfortunately. And so I'm just kind of saying what they think. I agree with you, Tim, completely. And let me finish this list because we got some more stuff on here. All right. 100 grenade launchers, 5,000 rifles, 1,000 pistols, 400 machine guns, and 400 shotguns. Over 20 million rounds of small arms mm -hmm. ammunition. Uh, uh, grenade, grenade launchers and mortar rounds, 25,000 sets of body armor, and 25,000 helmets. Okay, here's the question. Is that enough? Uh, I don't think so. And also, my question is, why the heck did it take us so long to be doing this? Why wasn't this stuff already on the ground in Ukraine? How long has he been there? What, 19 days, I think? So what's taken us so long? We did the approval. Um, I wish I knew what day it was, though. I well, should. we really don't know what's been delivered and not delivered. I mean, I don't think the news, there's a blackout on what exactly where they're getting it and what they're getting. And I think it's appropriate that the news not know what they're right. getting and where they're getting it. Right. So, you know, my biggest thing that I wonder why we're not doing, and maybe we are because it would have to be covert. Um, but why don't, you know, all those... Uh, you know, independent actors that were working in a, in uh, Afghanistan and all those soldiers for fortune guys, right? Why can't they go up, go out there, dress like Ukrainians and fight? Why can't we sneak people in there and dress them up like Ukrainians so they got more soldiers? Why can't we do... Uh, believe it or not, you're not going to like this answer. It's against the Geneva Convention. Okay. <laughs> warfare. Well... Okay, we can't do that then. Well, you know, I, I mean, believe it or not, as, as, as horrid as the idea, idea is, there are rules of warfare. Right. And, and um, all civilized countries allegedly adhere to the Geneva Convention. Allegedly. Set many, many decades ago. We already know that Putin is not keeping those Geneva Convention tenets. He's not doing any of that. Well, I agree. That's why he's been labeled and defined as a war criminal. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Jay, to you, um, we're giving quite a bit of military aid, maybe not enough. What's the next step if uh, Putin uses a chemical or biological weapon? Oh, fighter planes, for sure. Okay. It's, to me, that's the red line. I don't know if Joe Biden feels the same way, but when he steps it up to weapons of mass destruction, it's time to really get serious. And we should not allow one day to go by without uh, bringing in fighter planes, including our own. Uh, that's so outrageous and so in violation of all the norms and all the conventions that you cannot be permitted to tolerate that. We cannot 
tolerate that. And as I said before, he's a murderer. He's a mass murderer. He gets off on, on slaughtering people by the thousands. Um, we cannot let him do that. It's a moral question. You've heard the conversation with all the paneling, or the panel guests here. Um, what's your reaction thus far? I hate to say it, but we sound like a bunch of armchair generals. Not okay. just us, but you know, all the cable news networks, they don't know. We don't know. I mean, I got a I got an email from a retired Air Force um, uh, officer mechanic a few a few days ago. And he said, you know, um, sending sending MIGs into Ukraine may not be the greatest thing because the, the, you know, everybody assumes there's a lot of MIG pilots in Ukraine. I'm not sure that's true. And they don't have ammunition. And what about fuel? And what about repair and maintenance? Um, this, it's a pie in the sky kind of dream. It may not work. And we have we thought, you know, have we thought of the, you know, the details? Not clear. So I mean, all of this is, and, and yes, it is provocative for sure. So that, that's really what drives me to say, uh, let's do other things. Let's do those Patriot missiles. That's what I was trying to remember before. Um, Patriot missiles, they're more powerful than stingers or javelins. And we ought to give the Ukrainians plenty of that. And uh, as uh, Cynthia said, drones are a good idea. But I, I would add to Cynthia's comments that drones can very easily be offensive weapons. They can act as spotters for artillery and for stingers and, you know, and, and and javelins and the like. Um, and they can also be weapons. They, they can be loaded with explosives and fall down on a tank. There was something in the newspaper about this. What I'm saying, though, is that uh, we're not qualified. We're not qualified to say if it's too little, too much, what it is, what more should be. I'm, I'm satisfied that he's doing and spending what he needs to do and spend right now. And it's, it's a fair approach. Karen, uh, let me go to you. Uh, we'll get Jay back here in a minute. Um, do you think the United States uh, is doing an adequate job in, in this conflict? I know your position is to de-escalate um, de by cut back on military assistance. Uh, what, other than military assistance, what can the United States do to aid the Ukrainians? Uh, well, I think there needs to be um, a serious effort to go back to the bargaining table, including you know, with the Ukrainian president and uh, uh, Putin and the U.S. to try to resolve this uh, in a way that doesn't just kill and escalate. Okay, I, I, got I got Okay, let me go there. What if Putin doesn't care about negotiations? He just shows up for the show and he continues to aggressively push forward. Then what? Well, I guess you won't know unless you try because uh, calling that's, him a that's what he's doing. Exactly While they're at the negotiation table, ceasefires is a broken daily, and he continues to push forward while he's negotiating what then because that's well, what's happening now calling him a war criminal is a way to get him to the bargaining table and i think that biden's use of language against putin all along if he was seriously interested in resolving it diplomatically has been atrocious he started at the very beginning i couldn't believe the things he would say about russia if he seriously wanted to negotiate with them you know i mean you try to start with a, at a neutral point with a you know competitor. You don't uh, attack them and call them. Yeah, names. that was the question I was trying to. You know, I was asking yeah, right. Cynthia whether it was appropriate or not, and was Why that a bridge it too far? Really inappropriate. If he's if his goal is to get to the bargaining table, if his goal is just to con continue military operations following the Wolfowitz doctrine and dominate, then you know, perfect. You know, perfect uh, thing to do. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, same question. Um. Well, I don't agree with Karen as far as the um, the talks go. Negotiations don't mean anything if you're negotiating with somebody who is a known liar. And so I um, I don't think that negotiations are working. I think that they're just a show and a distraction for what's really happening. The thing that I am the most worried about is here in America, What's going to happen if he starts using nuclear weapons? So are we ready for that? I don't hear any talk about getting us ready just in case, because there's a big just in case sort of hanging out there. Um, but, you know, I'm going to use uh, Vladimir Zelensky's words instead of mine as far as what more could be done. This is what he said. Um, Russia has attacked not just us not just our land, not just our cities. It went on an offensive on our values, basic human values, 
It threw tanks and planes against our freedom, our right to live freely in our own country, choosing our own future. Right now, the destiny of our country is being decided. And he says, um, by May, and then he makes a great example. This is all from his speech this morning. Um, he says that he makes this explicit connection to the attacks on the United States, um, Pearl Harbor and 9-11. Uh, and he says, you know, our country is experiencing those things every single day, which I thought was a really important point. You know, these are things that changed our world forever and they only happened one time. These are happening every day to him, which I thought was really important. But he says, so he showed a video that shows the destruction of the cities um, and anybody who saw it had to be crying. I was weeping. It was so powerful to see the visions I mean, the visuals of what his country looked like before and what it looks like now. And it was just, you know, striking. And then he says it would bring, okay, um, Zelensky noted that he's almost 44, 45 years old, but added, this is important, my age stopped when the heart of more than 100 children stopped beating. I see no sense in life if it cannot stop deaths. And he was referring to the children's hospital that got bombed, that killed a hundred children. All right. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, do anything and everything. That's my answer. <laughs> anything okay. that we can, we should do it now. We should have done it yesterday. Okay, good. Uh, we've run out of time. So I'm gonna go around the table for last comments or last thoughts. Uh, Jay, with you. It's sticking in my throat, Tim. Uh, I think Karen must be reading a, a different set of journals than I've been reading, because what I've been reading is universal um, over and over again, article after article after article for the Times and the Post, uh, movie after movie, documentary after documentary, uh, The Atlantic, The Guardian, um, and, uh, and of course, foreign affairs. And what I get is he's a psychopath. Uh, can I say that three times? Psychopath, 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 who likes to murder people as part of his MO. And uh, negotiating with a man like that is banging your head on a wall. We've already tried. I wouldn't try for one second more. And as Cynthia says, it's no more, no less than a distraction and a waste of time. And, and uh, really, Karen, I think I'd like to send you some, some sources. Maybe you should look at the uh, sources. Actually, I read I... a lot of uh, academic journals about this, and most of them, if you read the academic journals, they, they support what I'm saying. Okay. I, I'd like to have a conversation with you offline, but right you know, now, it, hey, here's it really the good news, sticks in my throat. Here's the good news. What Now America is not a spoon-fed uh, show. We don't necessarily need agreement. I don't want agreement. And I like the fact that Jay disagrees with you, Karen. And Karen, you may disagree with Jay. That's what this show is all about. Uh, whatever you claim, bring evidence to the table. That's good. Thank you, Jay. Karen? No, I'm not, I'm not finished. You're I, not done. Go ahead. I want to say what I said at the beginning. Um, you know, we are involved in a much larger issue than, than just the slaughter of people in Ukraine. We are involved in the future of Europe not only Ukraine, but Europe and the world, great powers of the world, the powers of the world, the morality of the world. And uh, to the point that um, Cynthia made a little while ago is that the American people have to understand that they're only an inch away. They're an inch away in terms of Russia's uh, uh, cyber attacks, its weapons against us, its influence, its uh, effect on the global economy. We can't take this lightly. And that's why I'm a lot further into um, you know, finding a way to stop him one way or the other. He's got to be stopped. We cannot, we as human beings on the planet, we cannot sit around and, and watch commercials on TV while he is destroying the people in a country um, by the thousands every day. This is not acceptable. We cannot tolerate it. Thank you, Jay. Karen, either response or your last thoughts. Well, one a factor I want to consider is just the, the price that we may have to pay the blowback of these sanctions on us as Americans, because 
Uh, we're already seeing it at the tank, the rising gas prices. We're going to see increasing inflation. Some say that we're going to start seeing the conditions uh, similar to what they were before World War I, uh, where Western Europe gets a lot of its gas and oil from um, uh, Ukraine and Russia. So what will be the long-term effects on them? What will be the long-term effects of a lot of minerals they get from uh, Russia for making computers and other things. So I think there is some blowback we need to think about. And also, do our sanctions affect the right people? Are they affecting the populace or just the you know ruling elite in Russia? Because uh, hurting the populace, just like we did in Afghanistan, you know, uh, is not really, you know, where we basically put them in a famine situation is not really a, to me, a um, a good tactic, really. Thank you, Karen. Cynthia, you get the last word for the show today. Um, whew. First off, I think it's important to realize and, and know that right-wing media is still pushing uh, Russian talking points. Uh, OAN and even Fox News has so, Fox has sort of backed off a little bit, but Newsmax and OAN are still completely spouting Russian talking points. And we have to remember too that China also was spouting the Russian talking points about the chemical weapons being made by America and Ukrainians in Ukraine, which is just a lie and a, a ruse for him to be able to start using his own chemical weapons, which are considerable. They said they got rid of them, but we have a scientist that um, uh, came to our country that I uh, want to say evacuated, but that's not the right word. Um, but at any rate, he came and he told us in 1996, he told us that there are still lots and lots of weapons, chemical weapons that they have stockpiled that they did not get rid of. And they have one uh, lab that's still making them. And we know because of the Novichok stuff that he, he used on Navalny and that, um, the other guy, I can't remember the other guy's name. Um, but at any rate, so he's still, I mean, at that Navalny's poisoning was just in 2020. Yeah. So I know he's still actively using chemical weapons. We okay. have to get ready for that. We have to somehow get all the stuff to the Ukrainians that they're going to need in the, you know, in the, the, the face of a, a chemical attack. We're helping them with all this military, anti-tank, anti. What are they going to do when the chemicals hit? And okay. Keep we're gonna have to we're gonna have to leave it there. I, I'm sorry, but we really are out of time. We're gonna leave it there. Cynthia, thank you so much for your comments. Karen, Karen Buzzard, thank you for your comments. Jay Fidel, um, like it or not, we're in a proxy war. The United States once again finds itself in a proxy war, and um, there always will be sides in this country about whether our our measure of force in that proxy war is adequate or 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 not adequate. And I invite anyone who's viewing this show to write in and discuss their feelings. Email us at thinktechhawaii.com. We'd like to hear your comments about this show and anything said on this show. And until then, join us next week on Wednesday at 11 o'clock for What Now America. I'm Tim Apicell, your host, and we'll see you then. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.